Hello everybody and welcome to the War Room. This one is for the UFC 302 co-main event. Five rounds in the middleweight uh, division. Sean Strickland, the former champ, taking on Paolo Costa. Um, well, I mean, what is not to like about this fight? <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be fascinating. It's gonna be hilarious. There, there are a lot of ins and outs, a lot of things that can change during fight week, whether Paolo Costa comes in as a light heavyweight or not, like whether Strickland has decided he's going to adapt his style and fight differently in this fight based on his last one, etc., etc. Like, who knows? But what I do know is that this is, this is going to be a, a fun fight to watch based on the fact that both of these guys, they like a scrap. They don't mind taking some chances. They're both incredibly tough. Um, and I mean, they've both got a bit of an attitude. They're kind of, they're kind of like the bullies from two neighborhoods fighting one another. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, a fun one, a fun one to, to add to this card, especially given the fact I've just done the war room on the main event. Um, we're going to be recording a picks podcast as well. So do make sure you check that out. Um, for me, the main event is is less interesting because it's about if Dustin Poirier can do it, right? And I'm not going to veer off into a into a breakdown of the main event, but that's what it feels like to, to me going into this one. And that's kind of the vibe of the, the MMA fan base, whereas this one, it's like, well, you know, Sean Strickland was the champ and he su surprised everybody against Israel Adesanya. Paolo Costa, he's what, one and three in his last four, but he's still a maniac, <laughs> <laughs> and you know you, you just kind of wonder what version we're going to get of Paolo Costa um I've come around to both of these guys if I'm honest like they Sean Strickland has got quite a in my opinion it's quite an ugly style it's it, it's it's not very uh it's not very aesthetically pleasing shall we say and then Paolo Costa he's got like his techniques pretty good but his his fight IQ his his uh his ability to weapon select and read his opponents is not not where it needs to be and that's what I was talking about ahead of the the Israel Adesanya fight but what we can say about Paolo Costa is he does have good he does have good technique for the most part you know he's he's uh he holds shape very well his boxing combinations are good he searches for the body very well which I do think is going to be a key in this one and and probably the best part of his game is is his kicking ability certainly his body kicks uh, you know, we saw these on on display against Marvin Vittori. I mean, he was really cracking some kicks into the the, the body and to the the arms, um, and that was Paolo Costa coming in heavy. Like I I think that the middleweight version of Paolo Costa in shape is a, a handful for anybody, just purely based on the fact that he's a big game athlete with a good kickboxing skill set that can that can grapple. Um, Sean Strickland on the other side, he's he's not. He's not built really for this division. He's quite quite underwhelming compared to Paolo Costa. But his style plays into that fact because he's not a heavily muscled individual. He doesn't he doesn't require a massive amount of energy to fuel the machine that he is, you know, but he he is very good because he's got a, a style that's been refined sparring in one of the best gyms in the world, Extreme Couture. You know, he's tested this. He's refined this against everyone that's come through that door. And he's got this kind of awkward, modified Philly shell style where he uses his lead shoulder to protect one side of his chin and his rear hand to protect the other. And then this lead arm kind of sweeps and stings. It's a very awkward style. But, you know, I, I've, I've been playing this this quote in my head. I need to get him to say it again so I can write it down exactly. But a friend of mine um, who's uh, one of the best minds in mixed martial arts um, he said that uh, when he's judging fights, he said he doesn't get a a scoring criteria for the handwriting. It's just about the answers that they give. And for me, Sean Strickland's got terrible handwriting, but his his answers are correct a lot of the time. And so I'm I'm, I'm intrigued as to how he's getting to the solutions that he is against these high level fighters. And if you look at, say, for example, his fight against uh, Abus um, Abus Magomedov. He held the center. He pushed forward. He didn't have a particularly high striking output in that fight, but he kept himself safe behind a, 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 a his his good defense, his effective defense, and he let Abbas kind of work until he was pretty much gassed, and then started to capitalize. Like, and this this is where I, I guess this fight swings back and forth based on 
the likelihood of the outcome. The fact that this is five rounds and not three rounds. If this was a three round fight, for me, it's a different situation. A five round fight, although it's still not going to be an easy fight for Strickland, it's, it favors Strickland because he's got the additional time. If this is a three round fight, I feel like Paolo Costa can can have a similar kind of output and approach to Drickus and win ten minutes out of fifteen. I feel like he can he can be aggressive enough. I feel like he can have a variety of striking that allows him to mix in punches as well as kicks. Because for me, like Strickland, Strickland struggled with Duplessis' awkwardness, right? Like if you take Duplessis and you put him at extreme couture for two weeks and you let Strickland spar him every other day. Strickland, in short time, is going to figure out Duplessis' timing and his style and he's going to be able to capitalise on him. But the awkwardness of Duplessis and the unusual movement and, and timing of him, it, it was taking Sean Strickland too long to figure out. And then given the fact that Duplessis started to mix in takedowns was a further surprise for Strickland that he was not able to adapt to in, in the time that he had. I don't know if Paolo Costa is necessarily going to have the same kind of unpredictability in his movement, but he can certainly have it in the variety of his game. If he's just walking forward punching, he's going to be walking into Strickland's game because Strickland can pepper him and frustrate him and force him to overcommit, and that's where Strickland starts to win in this fight. If Paolo Costa can stay on the outside and throw a lot of kicks, and if he can also occasionally mix in takedowns as well, that's that's where Paolo Costa starts to eat away moments of this fight. And we come back to the three rounds or five rounds situation. Strickland over five rounds has 10 minutes to burn to make you tired, to let you punch yourself out and, uh, you know, let the anxiety kick in and let the body shots start to have an effect if he's throwing them, which he doesn't always. I'll come back to that. Strickland over 15 minutes can only lose one round because he's not a massive puncher. He's not not knocking people out. He's not submitting people. Like Strickland is is a walk you down and outpoint you kind of fighter. I'm not saying that he can't stop Paolo Costa. What I am saying is that the scenario in which Sean Strickland does stop Paolo Costa is because Paolo Costa is very very tired and it's probably fourth round or fifth round and it's most likely a standing TKO. Because I don't feel like Strickland's got the crunching knockout power to hit Paolo Costa with his thick old neck and his big head. I just don't think he's going to be able to do that much damage. This means that Paolo Costa can take a few chances and be a little bit reckless in this fight. Because he's, he's, his resilience and his pain tolerance will allow him to walk through a lot of what Sean Strickland uh, uh, can throw in his direction. A smart Paolo Costa is going to go go to the body. He's going to work well to the body against Strickland because if you think the way that Strickland defends, when he's drifting away, he's leaning his body back. So he's lean. He's either moving his hands away to get his get to leave something in in place and get his head out of range, or he's leaning away with his hands. But both both situations leaves his body behind. Now because he stands kind of like Stipe, like stiff on his back leg. When he starts to lean away, he 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 does move away quite quickly. It's one of the reasons why his defense, and same with Stipe, why his defense is, is so effective. But if he keeps being forced to move back, he's either A, going to run into the fence, or B, pitch his hips forward to make his body available for those body shots. And Paolo Costa landing body shots will then open up his head shots. He, he, he does work really, really well to the body. I've actually got a stat for you here. Where is it? Um... So 41% of uh, Costa's attacks to the body against Vittori and 45% of his attacks to the body against Rockhold um, would be really, really useful investment for him. Especially if he's got Sean Strickland trapped up against the fence where he just knows his body's going to be there. He could be punching and swinging and, and hitting arms and air if he's punching to the head. But if he's going to the body, that's a different thing. And that also works the same, the opposite direction for Strickland because sometimes Strickland can be very effective with his body punching and sometimes he can be very kind of focused on one particular target. Like you look at the, the Duplessy fight. So in the Duplessy fight, 90% uh, of his strikes went to the head. 
And when you've got someone that's awkward like Duplicy that's bouncing around, like you, you need to vary your attacks because most likely if you go for the same target over and over again, your opponent only has to think about getting one thing out of the way. <laughs> and if the target you're talking about is the head, which is the smallest target, you're going to spend a lot of time throwing and missing and wasting energy, energy being dispersed, and then you leave yourself open because this this is where I kind of circle back to where the the quality of the handwriting matters because Strickland style is effective until he punches with a with a power punch and misses and then he leaves himself open and again Paolo Costa he he's he's got good volume punching and good kicking so Strickland can't be really leaving himself open at range in this fight that's why he needs to get close to Costa he needs to pressure him even though he's giving giving some time giving some rounds away um so we go back to 25 minutes being more uh suitable for Strickland I I was honestly surprised at Paolo Costa over 25 minutes against Vittori at light heavyweight. I think he's much he's a much better version of himself when he is uh, a middleweight, mainly because he's not carrying excess weight. Like he he's leaner at middleweight. When he was when he was fighting at light heavyweight against uh, Vittori, he looked he didn't look himself. He didn't look as well conditioned as he normally does. Um, so not only is he is he carrying extra weight in the fight, but he's also done less work to get to the fight because he's that weight. You know, if he's fighting at 185 pounds, he's got to do the work to get his body down there, which usually leads to supplementary conditioning like running or whatever. And I talked about this in the uh, in the main event breakdown, the difference of Makachev is just sparring and sparring and wrestling and sparring and Poirier looks like he's conditioning and conditioning and conditioning <laughs> it's the same thing here I mean Paolo Costa we're seeing you know sparring footage of him and we're seeing you know pad work and stuff and I mean he just he, he looks like he's moving well he looks like he's in very good shape and then it cuts to Sean Strickland and he's you know he's like bullying people in the gym and like walking good fighters down who are just seemingly exhausted at the pace that Strickland's putting on them you know and it's like you've got on one side you've got Paolo Costa who looks like a like he's he's been signed to Abercrombie and Fitch to sell clothes and Strickland on the other side looks like he could you know he could sell you a uh, yeah I don't know <laughs> I'm not getting into it but just a different vibe entirely Strickland is in the trenches every day but do you want to be in the trenches against Paolo Costa? And and if, and if you are going to be in the trenches against Paolo Costa, you've got to expect to take some powerful body shots, kicks and punches throughout the first 10 minutes before Costa starts to slow down. And, and Costa may decide to grapple in this one as well because like that was a point of difference in the strickland Duplessy fight. Was it second and fourth round were really, for, for, for me, decided... Um, a lot by the, the the implementation of the takedowns, even though you know the takedowns were amounting to I don't know twenty something seconds of control each. They they didn't amount to a great deal, but they they made Duplicy seem more dynamic and more aggressive, and that's something that Paolo Costa can definitely use. What was he? He was one for one on takedowns against Vittori and two for two against Rockhold. I, I don't think he's going to become a wrestler all of a sudden. But if there's an opportunity for him to punch himself into a takedown and score it, it's, that's an, another 20, 30 seconds where Strickland's having to get up, carry and Paolo Costa, you know? And th these are all decisions that are going to be determined by the individual camps based on the fact that this is 25 minutes and not 15. Paolo Costa might decide that he just doesn't want to wrestle, but he also might decide that this is a one-round fight in his head and he's going to come and blast Sean Strickland out, the, out of the water. He's got a he's got an interesting way of seeing the world, Paolo Costa, and and sometimes he makes decisions that seem unusual to us. That I would imagine if someone sat down with him and and dug a little bit deeper, there's a lot of logic in Paolo Costa's mind. It might just not be uh, the standard logic that someone else would come come up with. Like I still don't know as the the weight miss was. Uh... <laughs> That's why I'm not. I won't be surprised if he comes in for this fight at, a, at light heavyweight, and we have a we have a catch weight changed all of a sudden. Um, a couple of other things. So Sean Strickland's last eight fights have been scheduled for five minute for five fives, 
Uh, Paolo Costa's been five rounds once against Vittori, so that, that didn't work out too well for him. But we've also never seen Paolo Costa as a middleweight over five rounds, so that could be a different thing. Like, Does the cut to middleweight take a bit extra out of him so then those last two, last 10 minutes he's not much use at all? Or do we see him... Or do we see him fight even harder over 25 minutes? I mean, like, he kept a hell of a pace against Joel Romero. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just think he's a bit of a, he's a bit of an anomaly, Paolo Costa, because he's not, you know, he's not got the highest of fight IQs, but his technique is is good enough and his physicality is good enough and his determination is good enough. A little bit like Marvin Vittori, you know? That's why Paolo Costa, Marvin Vittori was such a good fight because we're not seeing... We're not seeing the height of mixed martial arts when we're seeing them fight, but what we are seeing is a very game expression of it. And uh, and that goes a long way. Um, I haven't done Tale of the Tape, have I, Jamie? Okay, quick Tale of the Tape. So Sean Strickland and Paolo Costa are both six foot one, so there's no height advantage there, but Sean Strickland has a four-inch reach advantage at 76 inches. Paolo Costa has very short arms. He's 72-inch reach, but he he really does open up his shoulders. So uh, I don't think we're going to be seeing that that reach disadvantage playing too much. Uh, regarding their record, Sean Strickland has a lot of experience. So uh, 28 wins and 6 losses, 11 knockouts and 4 submissions. I'm not expecting to see any submissions out of Sean Strickland. But again, I'm open to being surprised. I just... Uh, History tells us that it's probably not going to happen. On the other side, Paolo Costa, 14 wins with three losses, 11 by knockout, one by submission. I don't think we're going to be seeing submissions from Paolo Costa. I think if we see any grappling, it's most likely going to be Paolo Costa trying to take it to the floor and most likely Sean Strickland focused primarily on being defensive and getting back to his feet. Um, if we see something additional from either of them, it's going to be Submission attempts from Paolo Costa, and it's going to be offensive wrestling from Sean Strickland. The only reason I think we'd see that offensive wrestling is if Sean Strickland feels like, A, that is a good investment in his cardio, and B, that that was a deciding factor in his loss to Duplessis on the scorecards. That could definitely change the way that he sees this fight. Um, knockout percentage, so Strickland's got a 39% knockout percentage. Paolo Costa's got a 78% percent uh knockout uh, ratio ratio percentage whatever um four knockdowns out of 673 strikes for paolo costa that's one knockdown per 168 strikes which is a little bit lower for uh sean strickland uh one knockdown per 203 strikes but still it's volume for for, for sean strickland i, I just <laughs> I don't see I don't see Sean Strickland cracking Paolo Costa with any big single shots and hurting him. Like and I know that people are going to say well yeah but he dropped Adesanya etc cetera, etc cetera. and that was that was a perfectly timed shot right on the edge of his chin as 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 Israel Adesanya was trying to counter with a left hook. Um and the other thing is Israel Adesanya is not built like Paolo Costa. Like the thickness of someone's neck and the 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 physiology of their neck and shoulders makes a big difference to to how someone can take a punch and Paolo Costa's he's going to be able to take a lot of Sean Strickland's punishment it's going to be exhaustion which beats Paolo Costa and that's where Strickland's got to invest his time and his energy making Costa work even if he's not throwing like Strickland did against Abbas walk him down pepper him frustrate him make him work make him throw because then Paolo Costa, even a, you know, a tired Paolo Costa is a dangerous Paolo Costa, but he's going to be limited to single strikes. He's going to pitch a single shot, which is where Sean Strickland then just kind of dips away and just bat, bat, and just touches you twice. And, you know, judge takes the scorecard the, that Paolo Costa takes the shots. He's more frustrated. And, you know, it's... Uh, I feel like it's quite a clear cut game plan for Strickland and a lot of it is invested in fatiguing Paolo Costa but Paolo Costa I feel like he can take it a few ways I feel like the kicks to the body that he was using against Vittori could be really really useful I feel like the occasional surprising takedown as well could be very very useful for him um, the one thing that we don't that, that Costa doesn't want to do really is just kind of play that close range stand on the spot and box with Strickland because the refinement of Strickland's game although it doesn't necessarily look as you know as uh, 
Julio Cesar Chavez as as boxing aficionados might want to. There's an effectiveness with uh, Sean Strickland's style, which could very, very much work against Paolo Costa. And the longer this fight goes, the more it's going to uh, suit Sean Strickland. I've got loads of notes here. I feel like I've got more stuff to tell you, but I think I've kind of covered it all. Oh, check out Sean Bedard, by the way. Sean Strickland has got his own YouTube channel. Um, that's that's a really interesting watch. And one thing that, that I, one takeaway from that, could go and watch it because it's a lot of fun. Okay, two takeaways from that because I've always got too much to say. Number one, Strickland seems to be kind of like running the sessions a lot of the time, which is not a bad thing because of course he's got loads of experience and he's going to push these guys. But he's also always going to gravitate towards things that he likes to do, which means that probably they probably spar five or six days a week. <laughs> um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. It is always good to have a coach that comes in and and you know oversees those sessions and even heads up the sessions and, and makes sure that everybody is in a studious mindset as opposed to a coach's mindset. Um, and the other thing as well is that they were doing uh, they were doing a wrestling session where they had singlets on and of course Sean Strickland's got a stars and stripes singlet with an eagle on it or something and you know there's a whole bunch of guys there doing wrestling against the wall and wrestling out in the open and first of all it's it's really really good to see that he's that he's they're doing these wrestling sessions because that for me is an area where Sean Strickland can take his mentality in striking and apply it to a wrestling game and he'd be exhausting to deal with in that range as well. Um, and the second thing that stood out is that it's quite clear that that, that they're doing that. <laughs> okay, so it's quite clear. To get people in MMA gyms to, to come in for a wrestling session has to be somewhat un- incentivized. And I'm speaking from experience because I've, I've trained at many MMA gyms around the world over the years. Whenever there's a wrestling session put on the schedule, people don't show up. <laughs> if you tell people that they can wear a fancy singlet, they'll show up to the wrestling session. It's as stupid as it sounds. But there are many, many MMA gyms around the world. And they'll be like, no, no, get, get your singlet. We're, we're doing a, a wrestling singlet session today. So, And as soon as I saw that clip in Sean Bedard, that was the first thing I thought is like, They've tried to incentivize people to come to the wrestling session by wearing a fancy singlet. And it was most likely Sean Strickland's idea, which is why he's got the best singlet on the mat. But it means he's getting his wrestling reps in. And there were some beasts on that on that mat. And there were lots of people that are very much the same size as Strickland or a little bit bigger. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see him offensively wrestling against Paolo Costa as a way of making him tired. And... Uh, if we do see that, it would be a very encouraging evolution to Sean Strickland's game. Because he's made a fan out of me since the Adesanya fight, as as you guys have known. And Paolo Costa as well. I ne- never never didn't like Paolo Costa, but there's a certain appreciation for this slightly on the edge of mental Paolo Costa that we're seeing in these more recent fights. Um, he, he's just an interesting personality for the sport, isn't he? And this is a bit of genius matchmaking. It's a good co-main event. It's great that it's over five rounds because that's where you're going to get your money's worth in the trenches. And uh, it's a good compliment to this card. It's good to see you all. Thank you very much for watching this episode. The main event, if you've not seen it, is up. We've got the Picks podcast, which we're about to record. Like, subscribe, leave us a comment. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, enjoy these fights. We'll see you next time. I knew there was something else I was going to tell you. So this is why we've just hit the hit the record buttons back on. Um, Sean Strickland against Adesanya. I watched this fight the other day. I watched it over and over again because it's fascinating. Uh, first of all, how Sean Strickland's able to eat up the canvas without really doing a great deal. And second of all, how being in the center of the cage, being in the center of the octagon, uh, illustrates very well how the scoring went in this fight um 
so I watched this through and I, I, what I was looking at is I was timing the amount of time that Adesanya had both of his feet on the inside octagon. And when I, what I'm talking about is that line that goes around the octagon. Whenever he's got both of his feet in there, I started the timer. Because I wanted to see how much Sean Strickland was able to push him over that line and dictate the center. And not surprisingly, the more time Strickland was able to hold Adesanya over, this, over the other side of that line, the more dominant those rounds were. Um, so where are we? So first round, it was a, a minute and 13 that he, that, that Adesanya was able to get into the center. And that was the round, if you remember, that Strickland was able to kind of get his game working, kind of kept pushing Adesanya back, but would occasionally give ground if Adesanya pushed off the fence and then he landed that beautiful knockdown shot. So a big clear first round, but the second round was the only one that people, that, uh, that, uh, Adesanya won on the scorecards and he spent almost two minutes in the center of that uh, of that fight now it, not three minutes not four minutes two minutes but effective and aggressive in those two minutes but as soon as that that second round was over it all went back towards Strickland and it goes 52 seconds uh in the third 29 seconds in the fourth and 32 seconds in the fifth so that's Adesanya really now trying to push himself off the fence and into the the center of the cage if you add all of that up Adesanya spent four minutes 59 seconds in the center octagon in a 25 minute fight the reason why I thought that was interesting is because Paolo Costa tends to do the same thing the times when he's losing is when he's up against the fence the times when he's winning is when he's holding the center it's not always the same for fighters. Some fighters are very good at sniping off the back foot. Sean O'Malley, um, uh, Corey Sandhagen sometimes, Dominic Cruz, uh, well, I mean, Anderson Silva, Leoto Machida. Like, there's lots of fighters that are very good at picking their opponents off on, on the way in. But these two guys, one of the reasons why it's such good matchmaking is because they, they clash heads. They both like to move forward and hold the center and unleash, you know, power combinations volume combinations with their opponent up against the fence anyway sorry to disturb your evening by dragging you back into the war room just for one extra moment but i i just thought that was interesting you know adesanya won one round and he spent exactly one round in the center of the octagon during that fight so uh be paying attention to that inside line and the octagon it, it really does it really does play into how uh the fight is being controlled and who's doing the controlling all right, enjoy. I'll see you next time.